Well, thank you for watching this video. And does anyone have any immediate feedback or question before I ask them? So, how many people live in Edinburgh? Oh, from Edinburgh. Oh, right, no, not me. <laughs> from Edinburgh. Well, I'm from Scotland. Why do you mention that? Yeah. That's stuff. Right. Not many again. So, where, where do people come from? How many are from abroad? What countries? Well, I'm from Hong Kong originally. Guatemala. Guatemala. Oh, Guatemala. Wow. <laughs> Who else wants to say one thing? South Africa. Right. Well, any other countries? I <laughs> Yes. <laughs> well, this gentleman have what's the name? Andrew has a question: Is how many people were born in the countryside and moved into the city? Not me. Or oh, just one and two. Wow! So we are three. The beach. Right. Why, why are you interested in this question? Because the cultural thing is. Uh huh. We come from out in the countryside, the way you interact with people, you, you interact with them as a community, helping each other, which is much less so in a city, particularly like Edinburgh, where you quite often don't know your neighbours very well. People tend to stick. Can everybody hear? They tend to be isolated. Right. But one thing which I find interesting, I mean, Andrew was saying that in a, in a rural uh, setting, people are more friendly and help each other, but not so much in the city. But one thing which I find interesting is the number of people in the film actually said Edinburgh is so small. It's almost like even in a village. Is that how you feel? <laughs> yeah. The city of Edinburgh is actually made up of, of lots of villages. Uh huh. <laughs> I think it's like a village. I'm from the northeast of Scotland, but to me, it's so walk about. You can walk about it. Yeah. yeah. And I don't find it like such. I find people speak to you very easily. In Edinburgh. Edinburgh. Yeah. 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 I don't think I can have most things in Edinburgh. I'm with someone I know. Right. Not Edinburgh, I am doing different things. It's amazing. I'm yeah. Doing yeah. So it's so small. Yeah, so it's so small that if you have lived here long enough, you you can bump into people easily. But it, it could also be a problem. I mean, some people don't like it. You have a mindset of thing it could be suffocating. If it's too small, does people find that could be a problem? There's a French historian who wrote a book about Edinburgh in the Pyrenees, and half the families are Catholic and everywhere are Americans, and the opinions are still in the book. But although it was a relatively small thing, do you really want to help with your neighbors? Yes. But one thing which I do, I mean, this, this size uh, question. Um, I, before I moved here, I never really thought about it that much. I mean, Glasgow is Glasgow, Edinburgh is Edinburgh. I never thought like Edinburgh is perceived to be so much smaller. And indeed, it is smaller when I moved here. But I actually wonder, I mean, back to those statistics of more Spanish coming to Edinburgh and Glasgow, I wonder whether the size could play a part. Do you know how what people think? Mm -hmm. I thought maybe the flights landed in Edinburgh. <laughs> Sometimes. So you mean it's, it's easier for people yeah, to go back home? Yeah, wherever you land, it's for a connection. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but Glasgow has some airports as well. <laughs> so I don't know, it's, it's really quite intriguing. But do people find it's a positive thing to live in Edinburgh because of the signs? 
Yeah. 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 Y
So it's a big leap, and it's really after many, many years that I feel more comfortable just talking like this. Yeah. Yeah. I remember coming up to Glasgow um, for your interview. <laughs> uh, we were living in England at that time, and I hopped on a bus, and asking the bus driver in pastry how to get to that. But after, you know, um, nearly 30 years, <laughs> we are okay now. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. I wonder whether anyone else has experienced the share the answer at this question. Well, yes. In the last year. Oh, well done. <laughs> 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 it was the most painful process. <laughs> so, why did you become a citizen? Well, um, well a, a British, yes, is it a citizen? Yeah, I've got dual nationality now. I think it's because I was really concerned about, at the time, what would happen. I, I settled here for 50 years. I have three children that spend, you know, that went to university here. My life is here. <laughs> Somehow was concerned about, you know, what, what would happen. Um, so I think it was getting increasingly worried about looking at all the debates and the news. And, and I remember the day when we heard that, um, you know, we were, we were leaving. The EU. At the time, I was with a group of students from Edinburgh University, international students. We're doing some very interesting courses in sustainability from lots of different, uh, lots of different disciplines. And there was, we, we were meeting that day to go for a walk together. And there was a terrible sense of doom that day when when we met because a lot of them. Um, you know, were not too sure whether they wanted to stay or go, but they felt that it, was, it wasn't maybe going to be an option to do that anymore. So, you know, there was a feeling that things were going to change. And this lovely way of being able to come and go, if you were a European, a European was possibly going to, to be different from, from now on. Yeah. 
but um, I, I know a lot of people who have difficulty, even if they wanted to become British citizen, because uh, they would then lose their own nationality. You know, and <laughs> being, being French, I can have dual nationality. So I think you know, my French nationality <laughs> is not the case from people from uh, Sweden, uh, people from uh, Holland, and you know, many other countries. Often people with nationality from your country first. Oh, um, and you live here in the same country. Yes. Why is it so important? Well, I, I think that I, you know, I, I wouldn't like to call myself just British because, I, you know, I spent 20 years in France. That's where I was born. I have a lot of relatives there. I want to be able to go back there on a regular basis, even to stay there. So it's a to go back rather than being kind of sort of oh. oh, well, no, there's also this, I have a French identity as well as a British identity. Well, a Scottish identity. I don't really feel English, although I lived in England a few years, for a few years. I do feel Scottish, though, as well as French, and it's quite important in, in a way. And with your French, keeping your French passport, does that enable you then Accessible in the EU. Yes, so that's absolutely. Yeah. Yes, and my children, it's the same for them, you know, we still will have the same access to the EU as we have before. I can understand that, but I would like Scottish citizenship, to be honest. Yes. <laughs> Not British. Yeah. Yes, I, uh, yes, I understand that. <laughs> Are you, what, what nationality are you? You're well, Scottish, but you, have, you can only have a British passport. Yes. Whether you want it or not. Yeah. <laughs> Some people really value it, but not me. <laughs> what? <laughs> but of course, I me, mean, the nationality can be just a functional thing. Yeah. I mean, I, if you ask me my national identity, I mean, I wish that I have a British passport, but I would find it very difficult to say that I'm British. Mm -hmm. And I don't actually think national identity for me is that important. What would you say if, um, if I had asked you what you mean? What is your question first? So what, what, would, what is your nationality? Well, my nationality is British because I have a British passport. <laughs> but I wouldn't say I am British, but I have a British passport. On my nationality, it's the same as I say, say yeah. I have a British passport, but my nationality is Scottish. Ah, your nationality is Scottish. Right. So yeah. And, and, and Scarborough, you identify yourself as from Hong Kong, but yeah. not, you didn't say I'm from China, China, you didn't say you were Chinese, yeah. you identified yourself as. From Hong Kong. Mm. I can say that I'm Chinese culturally, mm -hmm. but uh, I will not say I'm from China because I never lived uh, <laughs> under the current Chinese regime. And and there's quite a lot of uh, difference. Yeah. It's the same when we go when we go most of us go abroad, we say we're from Scotland, we don't say we're from Britain. Yeah. Alex and I used to have a group called Washington Psychology Meetup Group, and one one night the, the, the topic of discussion was where do we call home? In uh, you might refer to Paul as being Hong Kong, or is it Edinburgh, or is it? Uh, whether it was in Germany. Yeah, how does or home or relate Madrid. to a passport? Yes, mm. you know, sometimes you have you, to go your home, you would say it's Scotland. Uh, yeah. mm. And yet your passport might be French. Yes, yeah. well, it's both, so yeah. Mm. The home and passport could change. Mm. Mm. Home has to be a, a national identity. Yes. Yeah, I'm really, really good at the um, My father is. Polish, my mother Russian. I was born in Poland. Uh, I live in Scotland now, but I lived in England too. Um, I, I couldn't possibly say uh, what what my national identity is because I don't have that concept at all. And I think I wonder whether it's something to do with 
people who have moved around across throughout their lives don't necessarily need to have that particular national identity. Mm -hmm. Or all of them, I don't want to be here. And I have to go to school and get out of the school. Can you speak up? Sorry. <laughs> There's so many times when I don't want to be here because I guess I don't want to do this. For me, it's a very emotional, it's a very emotional expectation if I'm lost. Well, I know, it's such an emotional feeling, and it helps us both to have the British and uh, as I from here, I think I'm going to be the British. I'm so strong with that. Yeah. That was me. That particular remark that to people speaking in a foreign language, Speak English now. Yeah. It's very much worries me. It is politic. It is not the country that I have lived in all my life. We didn't speak to people like that about speaking a foreign language. Yeah, apparently that is. I have actually come across similar examples uh, from other people's research or papers. So that is not just isolated instance. But also there is also an element of uh, people being self-conscious after the referendum. Yeah. Not necessarily yeah. that they have been asked not to speak uh, in the mother tongue, but they become very self-conscious. Like I remember I went to a conference recently uh, about uh, migration, and there is a researcher in uh, major university, she has done quite a lot of research on the Polish community. And some of the quotations is some, from some Polish I remember one is a Polish parent saying that she trying not to speak to her children on the bus, in the bus or in Polish, especially when the children are not behaving, because she felt that other people will just... Yeah. Mm. Yes, but this is not a problem, really. I mean, yeah. have this poll on occasion, so the only way they can recognize yeah. their otherness is by their language. Yeah. So we don't have a really good history of dealing with otherness, uh, in There's a sort of homogenization of all identities and cultures, and the reaction is closing down yes. to a smaller and smaller, more, more and more specific identity. So that, because in every country you have this, you know, that, that people will not say, People won't say, oh, I'm just French, I'll say, I'm from Paris, I'm from Burgundy, I'm from <laughs> Provence, you know. It won't be like, you know, and, and the same, you have it everywhere. Like in, in the US, you'll say, I'm East Coast, or I'm West Coast. <laughs> you know, they won't, everyone is clamping down on a smaller nationality because of being put in a big pool. Oh, okay. So previously, <laughs> we were given, we had the first day we were that kind of music. So I had to know where you choose, and choose whether we were like big or small. So I can now say, I'm a Scot, I'm a Scot, I'm very Scot, too. And it's interesting, I just came out as a migrant, so 52 years in England, because I was born here, and so now I come home. But I do think there's something around the globalization where you to choose the community, the size of the tribe you are to I find that the, <laughs> the, 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 the 
question about why with the four women and, and did that just happen to be you know the two? It just happened to be, uh, um, and also I, I thought, well, it might be easier um, like, without the women. Um, and also, I, I, I started with Lila, I only knew one person <laughs> in, in Edinburgh, that's Lila. And Lila put me in touch with a couple of other people, and then, yeah. But I think so, what I found fascinating was how all four really got into reflecting mm. what it was that may have motivated them to come, what what it was they experienced and whether their intention was to move mm. on or to stay put or whatever. And it made me think <coughs> do people who migrate <coughs> particularly move into a culture of a different language? Do they reflect more anyway in the on the experience as it's happening? Um, and you know, when people mention things like the context changes, you know, suddenly there's a Brexit result, or suddenly, you know, East Germany is changing and you're in that context. Um, it just struck me how how brilliantly all four of them were reflecting. And I thought, I find that very difficult to reflect and then reflect to camera. But it did make me think, I wonder whether reflection is something that migrants, perhaps not that consciously, do anyway, because they're encountering differences and they're trying to make sense Things and sometimes they're trying to make sense of what people give them as instructions or, or details and don't, you know, that they don't understand. I don't know. No, I, I think it's probably a question of, of um, if you've experienced two different cultures or even three different cultures, you start to see things from quite different point of view, you know. It, it's, it's really quite interesting, even, even a new, you know, reading a completely new language, in a completely new language, if you, it's opening a completely different world, yeah. isn't it? So I think, I think this sense of um, how culture differ, it, it's something that you, you acquire much more if you, if you know at least more, more than two culture, you yeah. know. Yes. And it makes you much more reflective about what cultures are yes, about. And, and about who you are. And, and who within. within and, and how you also change in the process of, mm -hmm. you know, learning a new a new language and being in a different culture. Mm -hmm. It's been well broken. And there's a professor at Edinburgh University, Professor Antonio Surucci. She's Sardinian. She's given many talks at things like this. And about the benefits of bilingualism, you know, even teaching a baby from the moment it's born <coughs> to speak in two different languages, you know, like, like you know, not just putting your finger and saying one, but doing un <coughs> or I. That's why. Can't do it in Spanish, sorry. <laughs> Uno. It's as much as I know. <laughs> yeah, I agree that uh, encountering a different culture does make you. Reflect on your own. I mean, there are things that you might take for granted, and then suddenly people start asking, oh, "Why are you eating chopsticks?" Or whatever. <laughs> then you begin to to think about uh, the, the reasons. I mean, I don't know whether Constanza or or yeah. No, I mean, it's really really interesting. Quite because when you think about how I'm speaking. Whether you fit the cliches or not, uh, whether you give a positive example of your black man or not, that's fine. But at the same time, you also have this, um, well, the German term is not implied, but it's close freedom of being able to do what you want because you're bored. So people don't, so if you do something that you get bored, you can assume people just say, oh, that's a good term. Especially if you want to portray the right thing. Mirrors, right? Right. 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 
Sorry, this lady. Summary. What's the summary, friends? Could you stand up? Could you stand up? Maybe. I don't know about my friends here, but I. Yeah, it's starting there. I mean, Thank I you. Agree. Yeah, identity is a very fluid thing. And also the hybridity as well. And it can vary from situation to situation. Yeah, I don't know, maybe if I go back to Hong Kong, people ask me that question. I don't expect people to know, but if they ask, I might have a different answer from, from here. But basically, to me, the national aspect of it is not that important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like for me, I'm half this, half the other, born in another country, so I have no feeling of special, unique allegiance mm -hmm. to one thing. And so when people ask me, where are you from, I just say it's, it's complicated. <laughs> 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 you know, and then there's also the perception of people. If I'm in France, people will identify me as, you know, from, from the US or half Russian. Or, you know, I won't be French in France. I won't be American in the US. I won't be Russian in Russia. I won't be from wherever I am, even if theoretically I would be. So I also can't feel completely like I'm from one place. And yet, because half of your identity is how people see you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but even that, even the sun, the sun, the color, your language, your accent, that's your name. Yes, that's yes. all with your name. <laughs> yes, that, and but, you know, you can change your name. But who then changes? What did you do? How many changes in generations? Because if your parents are Spanish and then go English, and maybe. Your grandparents were from elsewhere, but then it's not defined by your parents, so you only sort of look one generation, two generations before. There's this thing like I'm from here, but then if you look far and far, you know, you can find migration from different countries. Mm -hmm. We're sort of so focused on 
this area in the way. So it's through this country, but if you go to Bar and back and the stories that you can read about them, yeah. sort of do focus on where <coughs> you from or where you're from. Yeah. If you, if you travel somewhere and someone knows Edinburgh, the first question they ask you is, which school did they go to? <laughs> 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 yeah. I would go to their school because my grandchildren are going to James Gillespie. <laughs> And then my and my my daughter in law works at the university and so like my contact with the children and her friends is a complete mix up of nationalities. So when I take my granddaughter to gym and I sit there and then my lady comes in and she's speaking to her children in French, and my lady comes in and she's speaking in Spanish, and my lady comes in and the children and she's speaking something that I don't I can't recognise. And there's a complete mix. And it's great, and I think, and I've met um, colleagues of, of my daughter-in-law, like you know, a, a Scottish guy married to a French lady, and his children are speaking French and English, and I uh, met a Spanish lady whose husband was Swedish, and the children were speaking Swedish, and and I thought it was fantastic. I mean, what a fantastic start for those children. And when you say speak to your children. In German, and that's brilliant because, of course, that's the, the best way for children to learn. And I just think, you know, if I take what you said about this has always been, there's always been that otherness. Will, will there ever come a time then when children like James Gillespie, just as a little case of a teen example, where children will be so used to other nationalities and languages and Children born in this country are not automatically British. You didn't realize? I didn't realize didn't that, that, children. Children. that children born in this country are automatically, or not automatically British. Really? At one time they were, but they 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 changed the immigration rules. Sorry. I think it's 
that comes to the first who only wants to work and then disappear again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. Most of the cases like that, I'm like, if you want to teach it. Also, I want to be sort of and learn him again and call him child. I really started to have a very dangerous conception of the monster because I did. I mean, um, I, I have an Irish mother, rather, right. who's lived in Scotland, and it wasn't really until the Brexit vote, and I started looking into it, and I realised that I didn't actually have to fill out any paperwork, that I'd always been an Irish citizen, as huh? long as I have an Irish parents, oh. um, and so, I, yeah, I, I, and that made me feel a lot more just positive towards Ireland and any sense of Irishness that they saw me as what has one thing. So what's the position now at birth? Well the, the position now at birth I I don't know, but then I've been reading about the uh, sorry, sorry to stop. Um, I've been reading about the government's recent statement of intent about central status for uh, EU nationals. I mean, it, it was announced in June that by March next year, this will be in full operation. And one of the things about children is once the parents, uh, the parents have got settled status, the children more or less automatically will, will get, or they have to apply. The parents apply on the behalf. But if the, the children were born when the parents already have settled status, then they will get it automatically. Yeah, I need to check it out. out. But that's mm -hmm. what EU national, yeah, that's several states. I don't know about oh, the yeah. other migrants. Yeah. Uh, for the whole region, the, the, the whole, yeah. thank you, thank you. Yeah. yeah, for the whole UK, yeah. yeah. There's still some new development uh, which will affect EU national. Can I ask the lady how easy it was to get to your, oh, it was awful. <laughs> Was so in the break, we were talking about the park. Did it go take a long time? It, it took, yes, it took, it took over a year. It's really assembling all the paperwork and going through the whole process. And yet you had the whole language, so it wasn't a language thing. No, no. And, you know, I mean, it was lucky that, for instance, I, I have proof of continuous work in the UK. And, you know, all the, there, there's so many conditions that you just don't even know you have to fulfill. And the cost is quite cost me quite a lot of money as well. No, it wasn't a, it was not a pleasant thing to have to go through at all. Mm -hmm. So I can I can understand why people don't want to go through it. Mm -hmm. then, you know, if they can avoid it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It didn't go through my mind that as as we grew up as people, we actually migrate in that when you're a child, you sort of go to primary school, you migrate from from nursery into primary school, and then you migrate to secondary school, mm. and then from there you migrate onto university. And each of these is a, a movement in life. I can't remember which of the one the problem sort of said. You, know, you, you don't go back. You, mm. you know, once you once you go to university, you never go back to primary school again. Maybe we should congratulate you on being a citizen. Because we're citizens. <laughs> <laughs> we're not even citizens. Yeah. I've never had my room with my letter. <laughs> <laughs> you have to go to a painful ceremony where you swear oh. to the Queen and you change to the Queen. Yeah. 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 And being a Republican, that's not me. My son was quite standing beside me saying, now, Don't you go out of this room after all this is gone. <laughs> right. I'm thinking about time. Well, yeah, okay. Well, how do you explain? Well, I think it's getting uh, it's nine o'clock, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But before we leave, can I just ask everybody a question? Someone mentioned earlier on. What is home? Where is what? What is home to you? Do, would you mind going around? I mean, if, if you don't want to answer this, fine. But I, I'm very curious. To know. What is home, or where is home? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, this is where I am at any given time. Oh, okay. yeah. That was where I is, I think. Ah, uh, where mm -hmm. I am. Yeah. Home is where my computer is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, where I've chosen to be, and if I'm not here, I say, oh, I'll be back soon. 
You'll be back soon. How did it tell you? Right. And that was everything. Oh, this is a phase of safety line. Yeah. Mm. And so you feel comfortable. Mm. And welcome. Mm. You're welcome. Mm. But also, what's about feeling at home on, 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 on principle if not of rational use, even if they're not welcome? So I think somehow it's been um, shattered in the parents and there and somehow going back and shattered in the parents that's home still, you know? Mm -hmm. that is it's mm -hmm. like really nice to read it. That's not always fun, you know? It's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it sort of becomes away from. It's not this fear of the UK or vice versa, but within the UK people reformulate. It's not a big deal to go to a different city. And the only problem, I guess, they didn't use it. They didn't use that as well. Forms were in the group stone, isn't it? You? It's a common way for the root stone. Yeah. But you have the roots have to do with children. And I don't have children, so. <laughs> well, I think, yeah, I think they're really settled. The Celtic people are from the UK. And the Lithians, what's the best thing? And the Irish. And they're so. They're really so Spanish. I think the Lithians Yes, yeah, that's right. Maybe, yes. Do you think it's maybe occupation that the work is more service industry work in Glasgow? It's work that maybe brings them there? Well, I think most of them come for work because if you look at the age of um, EU migrants, they tend to be younger, yeah. 25 to 25. So they're economically active. Yeah. And there might be some who can't just do this as well. Yeah. But maybe, maybe in the Edinburgh, it would have more defensible because why, but why is different yeah. between the two cities for just things? Yeah. That's my father. I feel uh, uh, amazing that home when I'm lost. Home is when you're lost. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. uh, I, 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 I've not travelled <laughs> great. I, 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 I get a great sense of peace and calm. And I'm like, oh, I'll be there. Wow. So, how many can you want it? Well, so maybe we can all want it. <laughs> <laughs>